Okay, I'm sure that people will still be joining us uh, over the next couple of minutes, but it's 10 o'clock, so let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Oriana Kalman. I'm the Visual Arts Program Manager with the British Council. On behalf of British Council, ICOM UK and the Museums Association, we wish to welcome you to this first Meeting Place series. We're delighted to bring this series to you to connect and share ideas around key issues now facing our sectors. This is also an opportunity to take these conversations forward together after the session, so we encourage you to introduce yourselves in the chat. Before introducing our moderator, Professor Ross Parry, I have a few housekeeping announcements. This session is being recorded and will be available on partner websites after the event. Please submit any questions using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screens on the menu bar. Bear in mind this is a multilingual audience, so please keep your questions short and concise. We ask that you do not submit questions in the chat box, but of course feel free to introduce yourselves there. We will also be sharing links and resources mentioned by the panel, so please use the hashtag a meeting place discussions, uh, which my colleague is now putting into the chat. Thanks to Claire Hill for providing closed captioning this morning. To access closed captioning, click show subtitles on the bottom of the menu bar. Additionally, Catherine King is providing British Sign Language. Please now allow me to introduce Professor Ross Parry, who will introduce our panelists, Nikita, Irini, and Niall, and lead them in conversation. Ross is the Deputy Head of School of Pro of, and Professor of Museum Technology at the University of Leicester. Ross also leads the One by One International Consortium of Museums, Professional Bodies, Government Agencies, and Commercial Partners and Academics that together are working to build digitally confident museums. So over to you, Ross. Ariana, thank you so much. And wherever you are in the world today, welcome, welcome to this meeting place. And I think one of the things we want to say straight away is that we won't finish things today. We won't complete things today. This isn't, this isn't an hour where we, we suddenly come up with a solution and present it to you. What needs to happen is new conversations need to start. So this will be the beginning. This will be an opportunity for us to find our voice, to pause, to listen, to hear from three extraordinary practitioners who are working around the world, grappling with digital, reimagining what digital can be. And we will continue this conversation as a network. We are so grateful to our colleagues at the British Council, to ICOM UK and the wonderful Museums Association in the UK for seeing this opportunity and for leading and coming together as agencies and professional bodies, these communities of practice. Just at this time, we need to come together. We need to trust each other. We need to share. We need to open up, look to our sides and see how we can help each other and each organization. And as we do that, we need to remember that the assumptions we may be making about our own organization or our own country or our own part of the sector may not apply elsewhere. So as we help and as we try and build this digital future together, let's do it in a way that's culturally contingent. Let's do it in a way that recognizes how wonderfully, brilliantly, magically diverse our sector is, how every institution is unique. That's why our project is called One by One. We don't see our culture sector as homogenized. We don't see it as one large uniform set of organizations. We know that digital change will happen in the UK, in Europe and around the world if we look at each organization on its own terms, what its relationship with digital is, what pathway it needs to develop to digital maturity and where it needs to go, then we can change our culture sector one institution at a time, one person at a time, one by one. I'm so pleased to have uh, Nikita, Niall and Arini joining us today. You know, you'll see from their biographies that working between Nerve Centre, Times Museum and uh, Future Everything, that they represent organisations that are looking in different directions, different sizes, they partner in different ways, they research, they work with audiences in different ways. So we're really lucky to have those three fantastic professionals as our critical friends over, over this next hour. Our plan is to 
split this split this hour into into two really so for the first we'll have a conversation we will we want to look at this challenge around digital uncertainty in three ways we'll, we'll look behind us to see where we were we'll then reflect on what this last seven months nine months has, has been like for many of us in different parts of the world and what disruption what challenge what uncertainty what precarity was was created because of the emergencies that we've been dealing with this year. But then, optimistically, creatively, collegially, we want to look forward and we want to start imagining what we could become and what we will be because of this experience. So we're going to be very honest together. There's going to be lots of trust and understanding. And I'm so grateful to the colleagues for, for, for spending time with us today and being honest about where they've been, what's happened to them this year and where they might go because of digital. Once we've had that conversation, we want to step back and you know, we're going to leave some space at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the hour for, for conversation and for discussion. So that's an opportunity for you to submit your questions as we're talking now, and we'll pull some of those out and, uh, and hopefully we'll do those justice. But like I say, we, we're, we're not assuming, we're not arrogant enough to think that everything will be tied up in a bow. It can't be. These are changing times. These are difficult times. These are complex times. And all our organizations are so different. So. Let's see this as the beginning. Let's see this as a moment where these extraordinary organizations are coming together and we can start to figure out what platforms, what communities we need to continue to have these conversations, to continue to have these meeting places. Okay, Nikita, Niall uh, and Irini, um, let's, let's step back a little bit then. Let's, let's think about Irene. how life was um, 12 months ago. You, you all represent and all work within extraordinary organizations that, that already were doing things with digital. You, you don't represent organizations that, that pivoted to digital and suddenly had to notice digital. I'm wondering whether you can sort of paint some vivid pictures for us then about, about where was digital in your organization and in your work prior to, to the disruption of, of this year. So, so Nala, are you okay if I come to you first? You know, you know, in, 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 in Nerve Centre, where, where was digital? What were you already doing that was exciting you and, and felt innovative around digital technology? Sure. Um, good morning, Ross. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so a little bit of context to who we are. The Nerve Centre is a creative media arts centre uh, based in Northern Ireland. We work right across Northern Ireland. Um, and yeah, digital is really at the core of, of everything that we do and have been doing for quite a long time. We, we work across the education sector in Northern Ireland, upskilling teachers, schools, young people. We get young people involved in the creative industries, whether that's through music and animation, film. Uh, and then we have a, a huge range of projects that work across heritage museums um, and collections and that industry within Northern Ireland as well. But yes, yeah, so both digital and digital creativity have been really at the heart of what we do and, and have been doing for decades. So if I can maybe, maybe it's useful to pull out some examples. Um, a project we have, for example, that maybe, maybe speaks best to, to some of um, the people in the room today. Um, so we've got a project which is called Creative Centenaries, which is around Ireland's decade of centenaries, which looks at the period of 1912 to 1922. And there's kind of seismic things that happened within that period in the context of culture and identity in, in Ireland as a whole. And, but rather than a, than a traditional, a solely traditional approach in exploring that time frame, we quite early on set out to develop a range of digital content, you know, 3D animations, uh, a range of graphic novels, interactive educational resources, uh, and websites, all kind of to try and reimagine and to repurpose the past so that it could be more accessible for new audiences. Um, but the, the key to that, the key to the success of a project like that, and I think it's something that we'll, we'll probably tease out today, is that it's purposeful and meaningful between both the, the archive and the digital. The two go hand in hand. The digital isn't just a catch-all um, 
or, or an approach that, that's taken for, for granted or for the sake of it. The two, the two things have to work together to be to be successful and to have some purpose. And yeah, we, we work, we've got quite a strong working relationship with leading heritage partners across Northern Ireland, um, National Museums NI, for example, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. And as an external organization, the Nerve Centre aren't aren't a museum. We're not a an archive. We're not we're not in that field, but we're an external organization that sits apart from those. So that allows us to look differently. And I suppose we we can enable museums, archives to step outside their comfort zone uh, and find new ways to use digital approaches to I suppose to reimagine, to to repurpose, <clears throat> excuse me, um, collections and, and, and content. And, and get those organizations to think differently about how they can use and portray the content that they have. Um, and a large part of the work that we're doing currently and have been doing for the last few years is really around bringing communities together and bringing people and the public together in a, in a shared exploration of, of a range of issues from our collective past, <clears throat> excuse me. And we, we, we have largely employed digital and digital technologies as a way to do that. So giving people a space and a place to contribute and to have their say. Uh, and that those programs are very much for very much focused, I suppose, on, on, on giving an immersive and a sustained experience, uh, maybe rather than a one-off workshop or a session, for example. So, so things that we've been doing more recently, you know, that might be using 3D printing, for example, as, as a, a method to explore museums collections. To reimagine them, to to um, allow participants to have their say and to and to think differently about what a collection or what an object might be, or we had a project last year, for example, which was looking at the suffrage history in Belfast um, through newspaper archives and stories held in newspaper archives, and then we ran a, a quite a large successful program with young people aged twelve to sixteen and used three hundred and sixty filmmaking as a tool to enable them to, to reimagine and to re represent those stories uh, in the modern era. So we're always looking to see how, how the two things can marry, marry up quite well, how we can take collections, how we can take archives, and then how we can embed a digital methodology and a digital approach within that. Um, and yeah, we, 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 I suppose we've been doing this for quite a long time. We're constantly diversifying, constantly changing, constantly trying to find new ways to do that. Um, and then since COVID came along, obviously that has, has uh, expedited that process somewhat. Um, but that might be, might be getting a little bit further in the road. But ho I hope well, that gives know, a flavour of how we've been involved. Let's get let's get into that because I'm I'm you know anybody that and I would encourage people to look at what Nerve Centre has been up to and your European work and and you know the partnerships you've had with archives in Northern Ireland. And it, it is you know we've been watching you for some time from over in our project in One by One, and it is just wonderful work that you that you do you. the way you partner, but the way you were already thinking about how to leverage digital archives in in creative ways. So you were already an institution that we were looking to as, as showing us how, how uh, digital, digital can help us create things within, within a, a cultural heritage environment, but also the way you very shrewdly partner as well has always, be, always been something we've, we've noticed. Irini, how, how about you in terms of before this moment, where, where, you know, obviously we know of your work at the VNA before and other, other kind of, you know, work that you've been doing and those other roles that you've had from Ars Electronica to, to where else. Um, but, you know, in terms of the Manchester work and Future Everything, where, where were you already feeling like you were pushing those boundaries and limits of digital? Maybe tell us a yeah. bit about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning, uh, first, Ross, and everyone, and it's great to be here. So. Um, so future, first of all, Future Everything, uh, at the moment, we describe ourselves as a, an arts organization and uh, innovation lab based in Manchester. Uh, future Everything started life um, in, in mid-90s as a, a citywide festival, uh, starting with music and then electronic music and then digital arts and design. And uh, when I joined the organization two years ago, we decided to start um, restructuring but also uh, rethinking a little bit about uh, where we are and what we do and we moved away from the from the festival format to a year-round program uh, of, uh, of activity 
So I should say, first of all, that we don't have a venue. So we work in collaboration with um, many other organizations, uh, venue based, but also non building based. So we work um, closely with um, uh, art organizations, with academia, but also with art collectives, uh, local authorities, and also industry. And um, the work that we do focuses, of course, on technology and digital has been core to what we've been doing, but uh, it's it, it, we work in two, uh, we are looking at it in two different ways. One is from like having critical conversations and enabling critical conversations about where we are heading in a technologically advanced society. But also um, on the other hand, we're looking at um, how we can uh, bring together different disciplines, how we can enable uh, digital to kind of happen along like arts, uh, society, uh, design, like other kind of sectors as well. And we're looking very much at uh, collaboration, but also artistic development and uh, enabling uh, artists to kind of create work, but also uh, finding opportunities to, to work in different sectors and in different fields. So very, we focus a lot also on uh, in non-art domains in terms of creating, opening up these conversations that are current and uh, important to different communities. Um, to give you some examples of the, the work that we've been doing, uh, like in the, in the past kind of couple of years and before uh, COVID, um, we had a range of projects from uh, innovation labs, and by this I mean um, workshops and uh, exchange between academia, industry, and culture. Um, uh, responding to uh, issues or challenges to do around, for example, uh, data, uh, artificial intelligence, um, uh, ethics, uh, health, etc. But also we've been uh, working on physical exhibitions and, uh, and art installations in the public realm, but also in, in within organizations. Uh, a, a, a recent project that we've been working on and has been put on hold at the moment uh, is called Unintended Consequences, which is an example of work that we've been doing, um, bringing together like scientists, but also uh, artists uh, and, the, and the public. And it's looking at the environmental impact of the industrial revolution, of, of the industrial, sorry, uh, um, yeah, of the, of the industry. And, uh, and it, it's, the, this also has a, an element of, um, of workshops and participation, which is very strong to how we work. We have this uh, very uh, collaborative and um, uh, research approach. Uh, act, we call it action research approach in how, how we develop ideas and programs with our partners, but also uh, with uh, audiences uh, as well. And, um, and th this was going to be just one, like a typical example of how we work. So uh, exhibition, participation, performances, like dif different kind of uh, activity coming together. Uh, and, and another project was a large scale um, installation that we co-commissioned with Manchester International Festival, Science and Industry Museum and uh, Electra Arsenal and uh, North Carolina. Carolina Performing Arts, that was uh, by artist Rafael Lozano Hemmer, who works with media arts, and it was uh, a large scale um, installation housed in 52 uh, shipping containers uh, next to the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester last year, and it's a touring project. And this was exploring the idea of um, uh, air, like uh, inspired by Charles Babbage, the British um, the, uh, polymath and engineer, his uh, say and idea of the air being this vast library of collecting any voice, any, anything that has been said or whispered throughout time, and that one day uh, a machine uh, powerful enough will materialize this, these voices. So, so this is just like another example of a temporary project. Yeah, so, it's it's fantastic, and really, uh, we've you know, and thank you for reminding us of the Manchester example, the containers as well, because spectacular. And you were already disrupting; you were already thinking hard about that blend of physical and online. You were already thinking about about kind of shattering some of those expectations about where 
where cultural experiences can take place. And um, I think that's that's why your thinking and your methods are, are so helpful for us to hear now as we're all trying to think of that blend. And and Nikita, you I guess that's, you know, with Times Museum, you, again, you personally in your own research and your own writing, but what you're trying to do with um, Times Museum as well, you, you were already playing with some of those constraints of the physical gallery as well, even before COVID came along. Is that is that a fair thing to say? Yes, because the location of Times Museum is really unique. It's um, it was it's a mid-scale contemporary institution situated on top of an 18-floor residential building, which was also which is also in a typical kind of middle-class neighborhood uh, in the city of Guangzhou. So our programs are not based on a collection. So we have the name of a museum, but we don't. Uh, center our programs around collection, but by closely collaborating with young to mid-career artists to develop commissions oriented by certain curatorial frameworks. It's also our kind of contact uh, response to the context of the Po River Delta region, which was open, which launched the open market uh, policy in the 90s and then the contacts and the urban environment were are changing rapidly. So translating the cosmopolitan and also somehow abstract and sometimes also critical language of contemporary art to our young and our urban audience is the commitment of Times Museum as an institution. And also besides the usual uh, museum website, we have been using several social media platforms to publicize and circulate uh, program information. Um, including like WeChat, which is of course one of the most important social media platform and also Weibo, Facebook and Instagram. But due to the divide of information sphere, which means the, the audience who will read uh, the contents from WeChat and Weibo are not the same kinds of audience who will follow our Facebook account and Instagram account. So we have long realized the restriction also of uh, digital publicity, which is also fragmented and transient. And so as an institution with a relatively small group of, I would say, educated uh, audience, we think of our public as constituencies and focus more on engaging them beyond exhibitions and foster maybe an emerging public sphere online. And we are also aware of the constraint of exhibition, which is usually temporal. And, and we our program center around four temporary exhibitions every year. And they are usually thematic shows, either solo or group exhibitions. And our young audience might not have that much experience visiting museums, even Museum of Modern Art or historic or his history museum. So they might compare their ex, uh, the experience of visiting Times Museum's exhibition with maybe walking around a shopping mall or watching a blockbuster movie. And so the challenge lies in um, whether, I don't think contemporary art can provide the same kind of entertainment or excitement compared with other kind of social activity or entertainment. So um, we think of online digital communication a friendly and direct way to prepare our public with what they might see or might not see because a lot of people expect to see um, more traditional kind of art objects in, um, in our exhibition such as paintings or more uh, to be more specific realistic paintings, traditional paintings, calligraphy or sculptures but we don't show a lot of those kind of works. So put it, to put it in one sentence, we tend to produce online content to contextualize what we do before, during, after, behind or beyond exhibitions. You, you as an organization and as a thinker and a, and a leader in this area, Rini, you were already helping us to understand what digital culture is and and the role of our cultural organizations within within our digital society and I, I think hearing all of you you know hearing Niall you talk about how you're creating new things with digital but managing partnerships and Irini how you're 
trying to understand that, that that digital context your institution is in, but at the same time, you know, managing those 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 new processes um, within within your organisation. And and Nikita, just just hearing you reach for those new tools and constantly be playing with tools, but also thinking really hard about what is art and criticality in a digital space. You're reminding us that digital is lots of things, that for us to have this conversation about digital, we need to see it as a, as a set of tools we use, as processes we manage, and a strategy we frame, but as things we create, we create digital things and those digital experiences. But digital is also that cultural context. It is, it is that society we're in. It is that, 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 that condition we're in. Uh, a report that's come out just in the last month from Europeana, authored by Jane Finnis at Culture24 in the UK, uh, frames this beautifully and, uh, and it links to the one by one project and some of these framings. So if we can share that report in the chat, I think um, it will show that way that you're all looking at digital and have understood digital with these many dimensions. I'm wondering whether, maybe turning to you, Irini, first, if you could maybe just give us an example, just a, sort of one snapshot example from each panelist here of of, of how did you respond to COVID-19? In a way, we don't want to dwell too much on, 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 on those challenges, but what, what happened to digital? Was there, was there one thing that you did this year because of the disruption of, of COVID-19? Irini, you first maybe. Uh, yes, so one thing that I didn't mention before is that although we've been working with digital all this time, we didn't necessarily uh, program online, um, so it was mainly physical events that we've been running. So, so for us also, uh, of course, all of this disruption meant that we had to, um, to take some time to, um, to allow ourselves to research and develop uh, ideas and also think how we move forward. We had to uh, rescope and redesign the majority of our projects in terms of um, thinking of physical, participation uh, projects that could potentially move um, online. And we've moved current, we are still developing this, of course, because it's not something that uh, you can do from one day to the other, but we've moved to a more hybrid format of working, uh, which means uh, a combination of um, having events online, uh, smaller, um, uh, smaller audience kind of section, sessions online, uh, participatory sessions and then also looking at the potential of physical uh, again like uh, more monitored uh, installations and doing things in, in a slower way but also we, we looked at the rapid response kind of curating so we developed programs that we could uh, experiment with uh, online such as our future focus um, platform which is uh, which was a very quick response to keep in touch with our partners and audiences to discuss how, um, how arts and culture could respond to uh, times of crisis and what we can learn from culture. So a hybrid response, being able to, to respond quickly, be experimental. Nikita, what was your experience? You know, I'm working within particular resource constraints as well. What, 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 what did you do? What happened to your digital offer? Um, we happened to start working on a new museum website a year before the outbreak earlier this year in Wuhan and managed to launch it in May when most, almost any other museums or gallery space were still closed. And the website has been rewritten and restructured to function as an active archive. And it was also designed to be more friendly for tablet readers. And actually, if people, well, our old website look rather old school compared with what we are doing now. And before the new website was available, we heavily rely on WeChat uh, to communicate with our Chinese public and to circulate the curated knowledge and information um, about uh, the museum programs. But the uh, reading experiences are always transient and fragmented, as everybody will know, as like social media platform. So now we use the website as a database to keep records of uh, our research trajectories, networks, and to make behind the scene collaboration, discussion, and processes visible and also audible. In, so we now we started to produce podcasts and vlogs uh, about three months ago, and also upload these contents uh, 
online. And we publish a digital journal together with the new website as well, which is titled On Our Times. And it is thematic, and we will be able to launch two journals per year. And the idea of the journal is to accommodate artistic thoughts and critical voices and to bridge young scholars and usually bilingual. They, they are invited to contribute bilingual essays or even sometimes we show documentations or documentations of field trips or kind of ongoing project of artists. So to bridge scholar with the art community and to also bridge our online or potential online audience with some of the offline or physical experiences of visiting exhibitions of Times Museum. So with our rather modest budget of digital or technological development, we are not really trying to create a huge impact or prominent visibility or big uh, visitor numbers. But I think I, I just came up with this word to consolidate a sense of digital intimacy uh, with both community in proximity and also with people from people and culture from afar. Key to that, and it's it's amazing to hear you respond sort of culturally, but you know, confronted with this 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 you know problem, this 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 uh, you know the pandemic and how it was an existential challenge to so many organizations to hear your organization thinking how can we empower scholars you know how can we change the culture within our organization to adapt so fascinating Niall for you what what was what was that that key moment for you how did digital change for for your organization yeah um, like Irene a lot of our programming and activity was face-to-face -face, um, probably in fact all of it so we had to completely reshape redesign relearn new ways of, of approaching this. But I suppose we saw it as an opportunity amidst all the chaos to, to try all new things and to step outside our comfort zone in a little way as well. Um, so a, a really kind of prime example, we had an exhibition at the Austrian Museum, which launched in February, just a few weeks before lockdown came into, came into force. And it was an exhibition called Culture Lab. And it's around exploring cultural identity and stereotypes in the context of, of Northern Ireland, for those who, who may or may not know the, the intricacies of that. Um, it was, a, a, I suppose, a playfully provocative exhibition in, in so doing. And uh, for those of you who are aware of the TV show Dairy Girls, there's a, an episode from Dairy Girls with a, a very famous blackboard, uh, which talks about the differences between both communities in Northern Ireland. And that is a, a key feature of that exhibition. So that's been re recreated and sits in the heart of that exhibition. And there's a new interactive um, touch table where you can, you can answer a series of questions and it will give you a percentage based on your religious background. So it's playful and it's meant to be playful, but also to, to break down those preconceptions that we may have about different communities. So we, we, we set out, because the exhibition had closed, because the museum had closed, we set out to produce a digital version of that, which could live online. And given that it, it was going to be in an online space and not in a physical environment, there were sensitivities around how some of that content would, would transfer to the online space um, and potentially getting a difficult message to come across. But, but thankfully, it has worked and the digital version of the exhibition now, now lives online and is quite a strong example of how an exhibition, a physical exhibition, can be turned into that, into that physical or into that, into that digital environment. And around all of that, around that content, what we've also been doing then since lockdown is delivering a huge swathe of engagement programs and still trying to bring people together where possible in, in, in a virtual environment. And that's worked in so far as we've still been able to, to use digital and creative approaches to do that. So while working remotely and without access to equipment and to softwares and, and technologies, we've still been able to help you know, young people to develop virtual reality tours, create their own little museum of me. We've had YouTube filmmaking programs. We've used photography as a tool to explore borders and barriers brought on by, the, by COVID. So we've still, still tried to, to maintain our model, but just do it in a completely digital environment in a completely online space, which has, has had challenges, but has also proven the ability and, and the resilience amongst people to want to engage around this content. 
and to still make that connection between you know engaging content that will that will benefit people but also give them a worthwhile experience so that after a program takes place they don't feel like they've done it just for the sake of doing it that they've built those connections developed relationships and furthered their understanding so yeah it's it, while, while it has been a, a challenge we've we've tried to embrace that as much as we can I find your work so inspiring <laughs> and it's not just my own family connections with Northern Ireland but it's it's I think it's it's remarkable to see your organization diversifying and I love that mindset of relearning you know to hear the three of you talk about we respond we retell the story of who we are we see this as a moment to relearn and think what we could be that ability to just find a way through to be something else, to reframe, to go to a different platform. It is, is extremely inspiring, particularly um, at, at this challenging time for everyone. I wonder whether we could just go around. So maybe just a, you know, a minute from everyone uh, as, we, as we kind of come to the end of this part of the discussion. I'm, I'm really interested if we think about, you know, we've, we've, we looked about what was and, and what you've confronted in the last year. How are you changing? I'm really interested to hear from each of you. And maybe Nikita, if I can come to you first about you know, the future role for your organization. I'm really interested to hear whether you will be different and whether this moment has changed you. So this moment of uncertainty has maybe given you some clarity on, on what you need to become next. I'd be really interested in a kind of, you know, a, a kind of a minute picture from each of you of what, what you think you'll become. So Nikita, tell us about Times Museum. What will it, what, what is it becoming next? I will be speaking mostly from my role as a chief curator because actually now we are diversifying our program and also the departments when and we are we also start working with new colleagues to expand uh, some of the programs from offline to online. So um, I'm trying I'm shifting my role as maybe of curating from uh, within the cosmopolitan art community and for just for the physical exhibition space to producing contents that might challenge the border uh, between the physical and the digital and also the cosmopolitan and the local. And also, I think with the emerging borders between, again, uh, cultures and regions, which is becoming the norm of the post-pandemic world, um, the value of Times Museum, uh, I think, lies in our commitment to the brokerage or the mediation of public knowledge and critical thoughts. So on one hand, uh, digital technology has the potential to reach out beyond traditional models of museum display and exhibition making. And I, I deeply believe the, the potential of also reaching out to a broader public, which might not even visit our museum in the future. And on the other hand, contactless consumption, contactless delivery service ruled by algorithm, digital currency and contactless payment, contactless social engagement are already our reality, but not something in the future. So I think of something a little bit, almost like a backward uh, a mission and how can we bring people back to a common table or maybe to confront our difference face to face and to embody our complex and entangled realities. I think that will be um, our future mission, especially in the post pandemic, also isolated and polarized world. As ever, Nikita, you've, you've articulated just so beautifully what many of us are trying to make sense of, which is how this separation and, and fracturing and contactless life, how that will change us in a, in, a, in a longer term and will we come back together or whether, will there be things where we can, we can harness that, that distribution, that, that way of being a, a distributive network of people and things and, and maybe the digital environment um, is a powerful environment for supporting that. Irini, how about, uh, or, or Niall, I'll come to you perhaps next. Um, how, how has this changed you? You know, how have you been changed because of this, this last year, these, these last nine months? Are, you know, is your organization now going to behave differently with digital? Yeah, I, absolutely. It has to. Um, you know, but before this, as I said before, we were quite a, quite a hands-on digital organization and quite uh, innovative in how we use new, new technologies to engage people. This has completely shifted how, how and, and when we can do that. And I think Irene 
probably touched on it earlier that that idea of a hybrid model will will probably be, be the norm certainly for for the for the next while while we constantly find our feet i mean it feels like every week or every month there are new restrictions or new things come into play which which have a knock-on impact on us all but yeah it's completely shifted how how we all can and probably should think about the role of digital and i suppose both in museums and away from those museums and i think away from the museums is is, is probably one of the more interesting aspects of that how can we make how can we still bring people to the content and to the collections and to the archives and to those stories away from the physical space and make that a worthwhile experience because we know what it's like going to museums and seeing things in the real world there's, there's nothing that can beat that but how can we how can we um, embellish that how can we how can we still make that a worthwhile experience um so yeah i mean i think for us it will it, a large part of our work at the moment is around engaging communities anyway and bringing people to bear around topics and subjects and themes we can continue to do that um, at, at various levels but it's, it's the connection between those two things which will be integral to the success of, of any kind of long-term impact of COVID. It feels quite quite profound it feels like you know both of you are are thinking of yourselves framed in a different way you know this is getting quite down to to fundamentally what you know what your organization is for and Irini is is that true for you is is you know is your work personally and is your organization future everything do you think you're going to be working in a different way you're going to partner in a different way yes definitely i mean one one thing that we've um, realized is that uh, how quickly we can adapt and how as a small team how agile we are but also we know that now uh, more than ever we need to invest even more on partnerships and collaborations but also in how we support other or institutions and uh, artist collectives as well we are already um, working with uh, organizations that didn't have the tools to work with digital before or didn't try that so so we're helping them develop new ideas and also online platforms but also we we want to um, we realize there is a digital di divide and uh, we realize that the the encounters that we had in physical events are not so easy to happen online so we're trying to um, experiment and find ways to reach out to uh, groups that uh, cannot access so easily these platforms and and develop uh, ideas with them to enable them to to participate and the other thing of course is um, at an organizational level is um, how we invest uh, on our team so we've been thinking about the skills that we have uh, across the team not just in terms of curatorial or in terms of technology and uh, or production but also uh, across the whole organization from finance to um, admin to marketing everything and rethink all of these and uh, and slowly changing them to to adapt to how we might be working in the future which again uh, goes back to that hybrid uh, format it really does it really does and i and my goodness, you know, Rini and, and, and Nikita and Anal, what you've you've helped us to notice, as well as digital having those many aspects that it's a thing we use and manage and create and understand that you've you are all looking in every single corner of your organization. So just before we we, we you know we hand back and we we go to the to the to the to and finish the conversation and take the QA, um, just to say I'd, I'm really struck by how you're all thinking about your organization, you know, what you are, you know, the vision of your institution, you're thinking about how you personally are all leading your organization around digital. In the way that you're, you know, now those new processes that you're that you're willing to put together, or Irini, those new tools that you're willing to, to you know, to, to look for, um, you are, yeah, you're building new systems, but you're also building a new culture. You know, Nikita, the way that you talk about, you know, that conversation that you want to frame with those young people, with those scholars, with those artists, um, you are you are changing, you are changing the discourse around around digital inside your organization and out as well. But what all of you are doing so generously, and I, I'm just hearing it all the way through this half an hour is, is, you know, you're talking about your team, you're talking about us, you're talking about we are doing this, and this is the work we are doing. So it is clear that you are thinking about the agency that everyone in your organization has. 
And that to me is really strong. You know, when, when we worked with Arts Council England and the National Lottery Heritage Fund over the last two years with, with Culture24 and The Space, and we helped put together with the audience agency, the Digital Culture Compass, and I'm sure we can share the link. You know, we, we were trying to respond to those behaviors that you've just been framing for us, that ability you all have to notice that digital is right across your organization. It's there in your vision and your mission statements. It's there in how you choose to lead. It's there in the systems and processes that you put in place. It's there in the culture that you set of experimentation and R&D uh, and innovation in your organizations. And it's there in the way that you support everyone in your organization. That digital culture compass has a charter where, where it talks about where we might need to look to understand digital and to build digital confidence. And it's 360, you know, it says be people centered, be value led, be responsive. And it has a tracker that helps any organization to look in every corner of its, of its institution and think, where is digital? Where is digital in this part of our organization? And how might we now develop a digital confidence there? Gone are the days when we thought building digital confidence in a cultural organization was about sending staff on a training course or just having a digital strategy on a shelf somewhere. What you're all telling us and what you're demonstrating to us is that it's a whole institution approach we need to take. It's a holistic approach to digital change that affects all of those areas. And you embody it and the work of your organizations embody it, but tools like the digital uh, tracker, the, you know, the digital culture compass are, are out there to help anyone work with it. We've had some fantastic questions come in. So thank you to everybody uh, who's, who's been asking uh, through. So uh, Oriana and the team, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy for us to kind of transition now to, to the Q&A side of things. Um, and if it's okay, what I'd like to do is, to, is just to pick out two or three of those, three of those questions. Um, one, which is a, a fantastic question that's come from Friona is around where your inspiration comes from. So maybe coming to Irini, first of all, um, if that's OK, where do you go for your inspiration? You know, what, where maybe either in the sector or perhaps even more excitingly outside of the sector, where, where, do, you get, where do you get inspiration for what sort of digital organisation you can be? Yeah, as you said, Ross, it could be from anywhere. So we try this. We've been very lucky because these collaborations that we often create across different sectors means that we might be working with scientists or with uh, with business, but also with video games, for example, or so uh, or any any other kind of um, background. Uh, it very, our work is very much about storytelling, so so it is uh, it's very important in, in what we do. But for example, one uh, one thing that happened recently is we we saw quite a few examples of artists uh, creating new tools, open source tools as well. So one of these examples was uh, likelike.org, which was by Paolo Pedersini at Mole Industria, who is working with video games. And it was, uh, this, for example, inspired us to, for, for on a project, on a youth engage, engagement project, that it was going to be physical, uh, having uh, a touring um, artwork, but also uh, a public engagement program and an online platform. This uh, helped, uh, helped us rethink um, bring in this kind of idea of games and element of games and uh, use platforms like Discord or Zoom, uh, but also other kind of messaging platforms and also by tools. I mean, sometimes we go back to quite, uh, you know, non-digital, but also uh, old media tools like post, etc. So we, we try to combine different ways uh, of, uh, of reaching out to, to people. So like, like is really interesting because it kind of create shows how um, we don't need to kind of recreate like an online exhibition in the same way that we imagine it. So it has a very interactive uh, response. I love that. And I love, you know, those moments where our sector, which is a very generous sector, which is a very open sector, looks out to other industries and can and can be inspired, whether it's the gaming industry or the experience industry, a leisure industry or, or wherever publishing and broadcast. 
I, we've got a we've got another question. I'm very keen to get lots of questions in, so I'll be pinging those to different people. So panelists, please, if you've got any other responses, you know, you can use the chat as well. Now, can I just turn to you for a moment about about data? We've got a question from Richard Light. Um, I'm wondering whether it is the Richard Light, the uh, the innovator who um, you know much of our work around museum computing began with the work of Richard Light and others in Cambridge, um, is helping us to think about the data models on which many of our museum documentation systems are built. So it's a great privilege to have Richard in the conversation this morning. Now, Richard's asking about data. And I think turning to you in particular, uh, you know, thinking in terms of archives, you know, to what extent is data being more confident with data, knowing what data we have, uh, finding new ways of configuring and connecting that data together? How, how important is that going to be for what we do next? Um, you mean data in terms of kind of museum collections? I, I guess well, that's part of the question. You know, collection. Traditionally, we've always seen data in terms of collections data, but do we need to have a more kind of expanded idea of you know what cultural heritage data is? How's you know how's the archive thinking about it that you're working with, for instance? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, so the the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland are one of the partners that we work quite closely with, and they. I wouldn't say struggled to, to let, let their content be seen and, and have their content out there in the world, but have perhaps struggled with the process of, of getting it out there and making it accessible. And I think before, certainly before we started working with them in any great way, they hadn't really got the capacity or didn't know the process about, about going, going about that. So a project, uh, projects like, the, like, like those that we have been involved in with them, have enabled them to see how useful it is to get that content out there. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the, the, the key things we notice a lot is that there's so much content collections, archives that, that exists within organizations that is never seen. And it's, it's only possible to, to, to really scratch the surface with some of that content and with some of that data. But it's about using, using it to, to tell stories and applying it to the right content and the, the right themes. So for example, one of the projects uh, that we have with the Public Record Office at the moment is called 100 Shared Stories. And the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland has millions and millions of documents and, and items and collections. But we're using, using that, that wide archive to pull out 100 things, 100 pieces of content that talk about our culture and our identity in the context of Northern Ireland. And that's gonna be a huge process, but we're looking at that thematically in the first instance. So looking at sport and at music and film, for example, and then using that to drill down and to find you know, exciting or interesting content within that. Then allowing the public and allowing our participants to come in and tell us what, which of those they find most interesting. So it's about taking the, I suppose, the ownership away from the organization at times and being less precious about what we think is important and allowing the, the public and allowing people to have their say uh, and really you know, tell us, tell us their thoughts. I, um, I, I really encourage Richard and you to get together because I think that conversation about data needs to expand, you know, uh, a fabulous piece written by Dr. Lauren Vargas came out in a, in a book uh, a year or two ago, um, a handbook of international, uh, of museum media and communication. And it was, it was about us noticing that there's more to the data of the organization than just our collections data. You know, there's a whole data ecology within our institution from, you know, the, 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 the metrics of visitation to the commercial metrics of the shop to, to the wider, you know, digital ecology of, of what, you know, visitors are doing in galleries and what's triggering on their phones and then what's happening in the wider city. So I'd encourage you to, you know, to all everyone in the, in the meeting to have a look at the work of, of Lauren on, on, on data literacy, because um, an organization that knows what data it has can connect that data and then can leverage that data is, is, is a powerful organization. And I think it will be that, that currency that's gonna define us in, in, in this century. Um, so Richard, thank you for that question. And, and Niall, thank you for your insight. Um, Nikita, I wonder if I can come, come to you if that's all right. We've got a question from um, uh, uh, one of our participants here, it's Dana uh, from uh, ICOM UK, who's asked about digital confidence. So we're thinking Nikita about your colleagues and your, and your staff, do you think, do you think the experience of the last year has increased the digital confidence of your team and those people on your team? Or do you think it's just 
allowed you to notice that those digital skills that your team already had you know yours is quite an exceptional team so this may be a, an unfair ex uh, example but do you think you, you and your team are developing new digital skills and a new digital confidence because of this crisis or do you think it's just allowed you to start harnessing those capabilities that were already there in your colleagues how has it been for you Nikita, are you happy to come in on that? Sorry, my connection is a little bit unstable here. That's okay. I think, yeah, because I have mentioned that our kind of special or unique context and um, the pandemic probably has offered us an opportunity to have us actually digital skills that we uh, before we have not invested um, our resources and also our kind of uh, our team has not been investing a lot in how can we produce contents that are parallel to the programs, uh, especially the physical programs such as used to be uh, public educational events that people have to come to the museum or there's several or uh, four temporary exhibitions that we always center around this programs before. And we think of, uh, we always think of how do we engage them deeper? How can we expand our uh, visitor numbers? But now we, we, we realize actually there are probably a potential group of audience who share same interests, or they have certain concerns, especially certain social topics that they would like to discuss, but they don't have to come to the museum. And we can also, um, we have this public topics that we can communicate uh, with, uh, with the support of digital tools. So um, that's what I realized. We have actually a bigger, uh, broader audience than we think of how many people come visit our exhibition every, every day or every week. So that is probably what we are trying to do now and what I think we are now developing more confidence in terms of how we can communicate creatively as the content producer. Because a lot of uh, social media platform, which I didn't mention, not WeChat, not Weibo, but also other short video uh, social media platform as TikTok that was banned by uh, United States and B, B Station. There were tons of independent content producers and they, are, they also have some critical contents and content with uh, what we think that will be, uh, will be shared by our public. So what should we learn from them? I think I'm kind of responding to the first question as well. Uh, people or content producers who are not working from within the app will become, uh, yeah, inspire what we might be able to do in the future. Nikita, that's such fantastic phrasing and sentiment to, to kind of allow us to kind of bring this together. Um, if, we, if we may just sort of spend our last couple of minutes now then kind of wrapping this up and, and think, thinking where, where, where we're starting. And remember, this isn't an end, it's, it's the beginning of something. You've helped us to, to see digital as multidimensional as something you use, manage, create and understand. You've helped us to see that it affects all parts of our organization. You've helped us to see that digital is the context in which we're in, but it is a set of assets we have, but it's also the tool that we use and it's a medium through which we build relationships. You're helping us to see all of that and having that digital clarity is what we need going forward. But I think what's really struck me and what's, I think, before I, I hand back to our British Council colleagues to wrap up in the last minute is through all of this, we've now and again mentioned, OK, we've mentioned TikTok, we've mentioned uh, WeChat, you know, we've mentioned some of those most social media channels. But my goodness, you know, a passing reference to data, but we've been talking for an hour, but you've been talking about people. You've been talking about audiences. You've been talking about ideas. You've been talking about how to retell yourself, how to respond. You've been talking about how to learn again and how to lead. That is our new challenge. Our new challenge around digital today in the culture sector internationally is 
not just making the technology work, which we spent 20 years figuring out how to do, not just understanding the business processes, which we still try and perfect, but it's what the three of you represent. It's about understanding the most emotional dimension to all of this. What do our audiences need right now? What do our colleagues and what skills and capabilities do our colleagues have and the potential they have within our institutions? And what can we do? What can you three do and show us as, as inspiring leaders to take us with you? We think the next five, 10 years of this discussion around museum computing is going to be around that emotionality, that effective dimension of leading digital change. We can make the technology work we know how to manage it in an organization. Now it's about us bringing our whole selves to these cultural organizations and leading with empathy. Thank you so much for allowing us to see all of those things. And I'll, I'll hand back to Oriana for a, for a final comment and to wrap up. Okay, great. Thank you so much to everyone, um, to the panel, Niall, Irini, and Nikita, and of course to Ross for leading such an interesting conversation. Um, it really is just the beginning, as Ross said, so I hope that all of you who have joined us will connect with each other following the event and connect with the panel as well. Um, I also want to say, thank Catherine for BSL and Claire for closed captioning, and of course our partners, um, ICOM UK and the Museums Association. Um, before we say goodbye, um, Emily's just going to share a feedback form in the chat. Um, your feedback is really vital and makes a difference. So we would love if you could fill it in. Um, you'll also receive the feedback form via email following the event. Um, and as a reminder, this event recording will be available on British Council, ICOM UK and MA websites, um, as well as a transcript. And we will also be sharing the links and resources that were shared today. Um, so I hate to say farewell, but it has come to the end of the session and just a massive thank you again to everyone. So wherever you are, good night, have a good day, take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.